Welcome to The Mind Killer, the rationalist brain on politics. As always, I'm Wesley Fenza. No, 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 no. Welcome to The Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Ineash Brodsky. I'm David. I don't know which podcast this is. Please send help. <laughs> <laughs> Ineash, which podcast is this? Well, this is a Bayesian Conspiracy and the Mind Killer crossover. It is officially the Bayesian Conspiracy, but it has the hosts of the Mind Killer on it because uh, for people who are not familiar with the Bayesian Conspiracy, it is a podcast where me, Stephen, and Jace uh, find a thing that we found interesting recently, and we talk about it, and uh, we think other rationalists will find it interesting too, which is why we put it on this podcast. The Mind Killer, Wes, real quick, what is the Mind Killer? The Mind Killer is the rationalist brain on politics. We discuss the news of the last two weeks from a rationalist perspective with lots of hot takes for <laughs> all of your take-hearing needs. Exactly. And the thing that I found really fascinating that I wanted to talk about was an article in the New Atlantis about the news environment of the day and how it got to be where it is. And I figured, well, fuck, I'm on a news show. Wouldn't the perfect guests for this be the other people on this podcast that I am on that talks about the news? And the answer was yes. Yes, it would be. So, so here we that are. is what we are doing. Yep. The article we are going to be talking about today is this article in the New Atlantis, How John Stewart Made Tucker. And uh, by this John really... Esconis. By John Esconis. Who yes. I've not heard of. Me neither, but. But he wrote uh, a real banger. Yeah, this is good. We should maybe keep our eye on him or something. Uh, although, let's face it, I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with everybody. I, I did actually see this uh, piece was part of a series. It's part three on uh, like how the media or what's wrong with the media or something like that. I take it from us having this discussion that neither of you read the rest in the series so far either? No, nope. I have not. The article was first linked, I believe, in a uh, Astral Codex 10 link post, which is how I stumbled across it. So I'm assuming a lot of our audience is already at least passingly familiar with it. And maybe they read it, although it's a really long article, but also Pretty a really long. good article. I would not normally have read an article this long, but I did for you. Ah, thank you. So if you're like me and you don't like reading stuff, what you can do is you can open long posts and stuff in Firefox. And then in the URL bar on the far right, there will be a button. That All was right, far so too much tech support. You could just say <laughs> Firefox will read it to you out loud. Yellow, you lazy bastard that doesn't want to read with your eyes. Google it to find out how if you need to. Is the actual like uh, text to speech gotten listenable? It depends on what you mean by listenable. <clears throat> like, does it sound like an actual human reading it or does it still sound like a weird robot? It definitely doesn't sound like a human, but it doesn't sound like that weird a robot. Here, yeah. I'll play you a sample. No, it's really not that important. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give it a year or two and the AI will make it as good as a human anyway. Yeah, exactly. I'm waiting for that. Right. I'm working on it. Give me some time. It's true. It's true. He is working on it. That's literally true. Damn it. You're part of the problem. <laughs> but the problem we're talking about is the problem with Jon Stewart. Yes. Okay. So the thesis of this article. You guys can see thing, what I was grinning really huge right there. <laughs> because of his new show called The Problem with Jon Stewart? Yes. Okay. I love that, the name of the thing. Saying the name of the thing is tight. All right. Anyway, how did Stewart make Tucker? Well, the thesis of this article is that uh, Jon Stewart kind of misunderstood the media. Uh, he thought that that you could keep all the business structure of the mass media of the financial world that he was in in 1999 and just kind of replace the phony reality with an authentic reality and everything would be good and people would have real news instead of this fake bullshit they kept getting fed. And that didn't work out. He tore down the pillars of the phony old consensus reality and laid the foundation for authentic, fanatical alternate realities. Which and is he what really this did. Um, yes. One of the things I enjoyed about this article is that I was there for all of that. And mm -hmm. I was like, yes, that is what it was like. Yeah, I, <clears throat> um, I was you're, you're you're almost my age. And yeah, I, I was there for this entire thing, watching it happen. Like I was the target audience at the time and I ate it up. And mm -hmm. reading back on this was like, I don't know, it, it felt like being like, oh, shit, that was a whole thing that we fought in and didn't even realize what was happening at the time. Yeah. And so like the, somehow like the, you were in Vietnam without realizing it. The article starts with like, here's what news was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um and it was <clears throat> um first first news was boring 
Um, and they say this is, has a lot to do with the fairness doctrine, which was interesting. Yes. With and, and one of the things they mentioned is that the fairness doctrine, uh, if you've never heard of it, it's pretty famous for requiring that like both sides of an issue be presented, which sounds insane to <laughs> the modern audience. But that was a real law that yeah. they had because broadcast TV was considered a public good. Right. There were only was- so much bandwidth. And there were only like a few networks that could use it. So they said, okay, as a condition of getting this bandwidth, we're going to have something called the fairness doctrine. So if you present one side of an issue, you have to present the other side also. And not just that. This was back in uh, 1949 when this passed. Uh, I thought the more interesting uh, condition for our purposes here is that as a condition of having a license to broadcast, they were required to broadcast air news coverage. So for like the first several decades of television, the broadcast companies just viewed the news division as a public service and a necessary cost of business rather than a profit center. Yeah, nobody really realized that you could make news profitable. It was mm-hmm. just like, okay, this is the thing we have to do and really half ass the business side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until the Fairness Doctrine was repealed that they were like, well, should we just stop doing the news? Or like, should we see if we can make it profitable? And they already had all the infrastructure in place to do the news. So all the networks were like, all right, well, let's keep doing the news, but let's see if we can make money off it. Yeah. The So in addition to this, in 1961, even like 25 years before it was repealed, historian David Bloom called this to a, a uh, coined the term pseudo event, because when you had to do news every single day, sometimes you have days where just nothing interesting happens, but you have to fill that airtime anyway. And so if you ran out of events of actual public note, you would do, you know, interviews or press conferences or PR exercises, like anything just to fill up some time, which was the stuff, the mass produced phony stuff that Stewart later tore into. Um, But yeah, by the time the regulation was lifted in 87, cable news was already rising. And the, (laughs) the problem with the news production is that like it has huge fixed costs with studios and reporters all over the world and that and you can spread out those costs by producing a lot more news with the same stuff uh so we started getting things like 24-hour news cycles and lots of news shows and yeah and one of the things that this article didn't really go into but that i've i've think is really important to this history is the rise of the 24-hour news networks yes because norm before that news was like you know 30 or 60 minutes a couple of times a day you couldn't fit that much into it and usually something had happened that was worth reporting on but with the 24-hour news networks there's not nearly enough news to fill that Mm -hmm. time so they had to just start reporting on insignificant shit and like doing these talking head shows where people fought with each other or and like go lean hard into opinion and stuff and that completely changed the news landscape yeah, I think the the big breakout of CNN was the first Gulf War because then they actually had something to report on twenty four hours, and yeah. even if there was nothing happening, they're still like you know, oh, it's a war. There's something exciting there, and that's when CNN really actually became a big thing, uh, and that was nineteen ninety to nineteen ninety one. So, yeah. and th- I'm I'm curious, did this section of the essay impact how you guys? think about how we on our news show should handle slow news fortnights because we have had those and we've kind of done this where we just like find stuff to fill out our outline no you guys have done this and i keep telling you don't put on stuff that's not worth talking about and i delete it (laughs) <laughs> and we thank you for that. I oftentimes in a show, since we try to keep it to an hour or an hour and a half, I will have things that I like just pull out and I'm like, I can't discuss this. There's not enough time. And if we do have a slow news week, I'll be like, is that thing that I pulled out still relevant? It is. I'm going to stick it in here because I did want to talk about. Yeah. That. And when that actually happened a few episodes ago where we, we yeah. didn't have a lot of news. So we covered some stuff that we had missed in previous weeks. But I thought all that was like actually important stuff that we cared about. I agree. Um, I have. I know. I've said in our uh, our private channel several times, like guys, it doesn't matter if we have a short episode; it's fine. Yeah, and that is true. Let's not let's not cover shit that's not worth covering. Hmm. Um, um. So this this article identifies 1999 as peak news. Yes, which is the time where the news made the most money, 
um, in that time period, but more relevantly, it was the most people employed in the news business um, in history, and it, and it declined from there. Yeah, I believe the peak was July 2000, which is basically 99. Okay. And that, that was the peak of 1.6 million people. And this particularly struck me because I graduated high school in 98 and I wanted to go into journalism, right? Like oh, I man. was the... I was the English major guy. I scored a perfect 800 on the English section of my SAT. Like what I really wanted to do was write fiction, but I know that didn't pay anything. So you go into journalism to use words to make money. And my mom was like, no, don't do that. That's that's stupid. English majors never make money. Go, go do something else practical like computer science instead. And I was kind of a, a pushover and had... I had issues, so I did that, which uh, in the end turned out to be the right call. Oh, my God. So is this your lifelong dream, what we're doing right now? No, no, it's not. I don't but, know. It kind of sounds like it is. But it's uh, it's adjacent to it. How about that? Like, it's my, it was my dream of how to, you know, put in a day's work and make some money instead of doing what I really wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, second prize, you know. But I, I'm glad I didn't because just a few years later, the bottom fell out of the journalism <laughs> market. And it, it was very much a, oh, my God, the road not traveled kind of thing. Yeah. I, I'm happy I'm not destitute. Yeah. Ooh, journalism was not a good field to go into at that no. time. No. Sorry if uh, sorry if I'm being a little quiet at the moment. Unlike these olds, I was five years old in the year of peak <laughs> news. So... Yeah, the, I think that's brought up more than once in the uh, in the article itself is that 1999 was also the year of the Matrix and Fight Club, which were very much Fight Club, especially like explicitly against um, the mass media landscape of just like, here is blah entertainment to keep you busy by our product. Like it was very much a rebellion against this mass uh, mass culture that sucked and was the lowest common denominator culture. And uh, I don't think that was a coincidence. Well, that was also just a very 90s attitude. Well, yes, but because this is what we had to live in. It's true. Um, yeah. So the the whole it goes through like what the news was like in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. just all this like phony bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, Prepackaged corporate talking points, um, <clears throat> you know, corporate shills coming out and just saying whatever they're paid to say um, and stories. It was it was really the 90s were the turn from like, you know, sober. We report on the important issues to like the media circus right. where it's like they shit just gets covered because people are like voyeuristically, um, you know, uh, 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 activated by it. Yeah. Like, and, and specifically I'll, I'll talks about O.J. Simpson. Mm -hmm. the, the whole Lacey Peterson thing, which if you guys don't know, it is really hard to to convey how big a news story this was. Was this just like one white girl was missing? Do you remember how big fucking Monica Lewinsky was? Oh, my that God. That the president yeah. got a blowjob? It was fucking, I don't know, more than a year of hay they made out of that? Yeah, but some, see, I feel like something like that would be just as big today. I, I feel like you didn't pay much attention during the Trump administration. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I feel I feel like, yeah, I feel like presidential sex scandals kind of died with 45 because the man was one giant walking sex scandal. <laughs> yeah, true. I guess the Access Hollywood tape was kind of the like the death of that as, mm -hmm. as something worth reporting on much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's equally stupid stuff that would. <laughs> uh, blow up in similar ways nowadays. Although with the internet shortening everyone's attention span, I'm not sure we could uh, manage to pay attention for an entire year. But um, yeah, sex scandals specifically. Heard of <laughs> I mean, I've heard that that was a thing for about two weeks, and then the the reanimated corpses of the people we're talking about now have been trying to make it a thing for the past uh, year and almost two years. Two now, years. Almost. Um, yeah, if by that you mean the New York Times, failing. then yes. Yes, <laughs> I correct. do mean the New York Times. Um, <clears throat> they, the, the article discusses um, yeah, how the economy of the time worked and that this wasn't 
this was not just because they decided to make things bad and bland. It was really a artifact of how how the world worked, how this was financed, because news was paid for by advertising. And back then, you didn't have personalization. Like ads only worked by blasting the largest possible audience with the most lower, lowest common denominator appealing message, right? Like mass appeal was required and therefore blandness was too. Yeah, and the news was on major broadcast networks that everyone in the country watched. Mm-hmm. So it was like the same... You'd have your local news, but then like the national news, everyone got the same national news. There was no um, real targeting. Yeah. And so the ads were trying to reach literally everybody in the nation all at once. Yeah. And, all- and, and so the news had to cater to that and had, yeah. to, had to report the news that like everyone could watch. So yes. they, couldn't, they couldn't develop a niche audience. Um, it had to just be mass appeal. From from the article, the line was, all content decisions flowed from this imperative. And it's true. All right. And then enter John Stewart. Enter John Stewart. Yes. Uh, John Stewart thought that that wasn't the case. And uh, you could just put good stuff on TV and it would be fine. Yeah. And John Stewart took over The Daily Show on Comedy Central, which mm-hmm. was an established show that had been hosted by Craig Kilborn. And it was lame. It was super lame. I, I don't think I ever watched it, but they run ads for it all the time. And I'd be like, that looks stupid. I'm not going to watch mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And from what they tell me, it was just like kind of wacky jokes and, you know, tomfoolery that was dumb. Yeah. It, I mean, I think I saw one episode and I thought this is like a really bad version of SNL's Weekend Update that goes on for too long. Why would I bother watching it? Yeah. So John Stewart gets the gig after Craig Kilborn and he's like, all right, we're not going to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to report – we're not going to report on the news as in like what recently happened. We're going to report on the news media. Yes. And just make fun of them Mm -hmm. because there's – and it was so easy because of everything we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And his bread and butter – and this is from the article, but I remember this as accurate – is that he would just take – a clip of somebody saying something (laughs) yesterday Uh and then find a clip of them from like three years ago saying the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like pretty standard to people today, Mm -hmm. but nobody had done this before. Like there was no, um, I think the the internet was had was in its infancy. Um, There was no archival footage. You could just uh, look up. There was no Twitter. So you could just like look at someone's old tweets. Um, their big like competitive advantage was they would go back and get all this archival footage and just go through it. Yeah, they had a whole staff that basically just did that. It from the article. This is a great line. This true fact uh, that will sound insane to anyone under the age of thirty. People on television reasonably assumed that no one would hear what they had said ever again. If you change your tune in months or years afterwards, who would remember? Uh, as the representative under 30 on this show, yes, that does in fact sound kind of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like how, just think about without the internet, how would you, how would you find anything? Yeah. You'd have to uh, have uh, recorded it on VHS. Yeah, no, like on reflection, it, uh, it makes sense. I just, it, it sounds like you're describing how Martians live. Yeah. And, and so and but so and before Jon Stewart, like people knew that this was the environment they're living in. So they had no compunction about saying well, something that was directly complicated or directly contradicted by something they had said a couple of years earlier, because like nobody's nobody remembers that. Mm-hmm. But it, Jon Stewart it, remembers. Oh, yes, he does. It, there was always a clip that that's almost became like a tagline of the show's fans that there's always a clip. Yeah, in the same way you say there's always a tweet now. Yeah, mm. exactly. And it was great. Like you saw someone, you saw them start a a topic on the show, and you were like, "Oh God, oh this is going to be excellent." There's going to be something hilarious and really fucked up that we're about to see with with a clip. Yeah, but the, so the article claims that Stewart had much bigger ideas than just like <laughs> yes. let's make fun of the newsmakers. 
Yeah. He, what was this here? Uh, he, he maintained, like George Carlin, that a high view of comedy as an art form for social commentary. And when he took over the show, like they didn't want to let him do this at first. Uh, it quotes him as saying to the show, well, to the executives at the at Comedy Central, let's make a deal. Let me do the thing that I believe in. And if it sucks and it doesn't sell you enough beer, you can fire me. And by the end of the run, he was making more than any other late night television personality and possibly more than anyone in the entire news business at 25 million a year. Yeah. And I think what really, I think what really made him was George W. Bush. This is not from the article, but this is Mm -hmm. my recollection of it is that Mm -hmm. the way the news was covered, especially post nine 11 was like absolute reverence for the president and the office and like had the utmost respect for everything. Right. Right. And like solemn and Stuart would look at this and be like, what the fuck? Because W was objectively funny. Yes. Like he was constantly saying dumb shit and, and stuff that didn't make sense. Uh, And especially leading up to the Iraq war, they were constantly contradicting themselves and putting on these presentations that made no sense. And and just lying all the time in really easily provable ways. And the yeah. regular news media just didn't didn't cover it at all. They would just kind of like stenographically report, well, here's what they said. And Stuart would get it and be like, look at this, look at this, look at this. <laughs> and his his liberal audience loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was it, it, and it's hard, it's so hard to like look at the modern media landscape and and think about what it was like back then, because that was the only place where anyone was questioning the president. Yeah. On a stupid comedy show mm-hmm. that was like that, that followed crank yankers. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a crazy fucking time to live. Yeah. It was like you'd have like weird like you could read letters to the editor in like the alt weekly. Mm -hmm. Or you could watch Jon Stewart. And that was the only people saying like, hey, this W guy seems like actually kind of a clown. Mm -hmm. And like everyone else was like, oh, yes, the august office of the president. Uh, Here's what the press release said today. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I I, I wish David could have been there. (laughs) (laughs) I don't. It was bad. I mean, it was bad, but it was a hell of a time to live because you could be the thing was you could be part of the rebellious counterculture and be right (laughs) like just objectively because no one else was reporting on this like you said it was just the young rebellious youth Uh, that were the jeff stewart was like what 24 or something that was doing this and uh nobody else was paying any attention at all and uh that it felt good uh, well, that was so, the real. So I I do actually buy that because I read Zvi's blog during COVID. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, I, but that was the real. That was the real gift of the Iraq War to our generation because we were all mostly liberal, um, all mostly against the Iraq War, and it turned out to actually be complete bullshit. Mm-hmm. And like, how often does that happen? Where it's just wow. Every single justification was wrong. Yeah. Like we were saying, like one side was 100% right and the other side was 100% wrong. Right. And it's like, wow, that never happens. But in this one instance, it did. And I think that's probably to blame for a lot of uh, the the environment we're in now, or especially how, how people of our generation kind of look at um, cultural issues. Mm-hmm. It's like because we had that in those formative years, we had this one thing where we were completely right and everyone with any kind of institutional power was wrong. Yeah. And it's just I feel like you can't understand millennials without recognizing that. Um, Gen X, (laughs) don't flatter yourself. No, 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 no. Gen X doesn't give a shit about anything. That's their whole thing. Mm, Gen X were major watchers of the Daily Show. They're much more jaded, yeah. but um, no, that's true. But th- this is, but like Iraq War was two thousand three, um, where Gen X had was was in their twenties by then. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I'm talking about the people that were in their teens when that was happening. Okay, okay, fair enough. Yeah, um, 
But yeah, Gen X, Gen X took this and just mm-hmm. became more jaded. Well, were they wrong? No. <laughs> okay. I, I, so I'm like one of those, you know, exennials they call us, where we're like in between the two. I identify I much more with Gen X. Yeah. Because they're like, yeah, who? Every, everything's stupid. Nothing matters. Who cares? And I'm like, yeah, who mm-hmm. cares? Mm-hmm. <laughs> These damn millennials who are like, care about everything. Keep caring. Like, no, why not? <laughs> Yeah, no, don't, don't, don't. You know what? Let's not rage on the millennials because David is here. Uh, Especially I, David. So <laughs> I am on the other side of the millennial split, and I actually identify. I kind of identify more with the Zoomers, except when they start talking about like TikTok and stuff. <laughs> anyway, the kids today terrible, right? Yep. Yes. All right, good. So, I'm glad we uh, established that. So anyway, what were we talking about? John Stewart? Yeah. Do we want to talk about one of the defining media moments of the 2000s? Uh, not Hell really, but it's kind of the shtick of the show, so go on. <laughs> Do you remember the Crossfire interview? Oh, yeah. Nope. Was that, I, well, was that 2000s? Don't. When did that actually happen? I think it was 2004. Yeah, that sounds right, because I think it was post-Iraq. Yeah. It was, a, it was a show on CNN where a conservative and a liberal pundit talk to each other a lot uh, and fake debate each other on the news of the day. And Jon Stewart was invited on. And, oh, my God, he ripped a giant asshole into the entire news industry and, and then, like, put a bomb inside of it or something. <laughs> like, it was, it was so – you know that feeling you get when, like – um a a powerful evil force is just brought down by one teenage farm boy in an X-Wing and you just want to scream and cheer because it was so amazing that this happened. It, it was kind of like watching that happen on CNN. It really was. And it was bigger than things get today. Like yeah. everyone saw that interview. Mm-hmm. And it was Jon Stewart coming in to Crossfire, getting interviewed by Tucker Carlson. Mm-hmm. Who was the conservative host on Crossfire and Jon Stewart being like, I'm not going to answer your dumb questions. I'm just going to tell you your show is bad and you should feel bad. And yes. here's why it's bad. And yeah. Tucker was just completely unprepared for him. And the other guy, too, which we oh, don't yeah, remember. The other, guy, the other guy, his whole thing was being completely unprepared. <laughs> like, that was the point of like, that was on Fox. That was like, it wasn't quite Hannity and Combs mm-hmm. where. Where Hannity was like a guy with a personality and Combs was just this miserable sack of shit that was there to be hated. Right. Um, but still, like, whenever they did these shows, the guy they got to be the liberal was always kind of not great. This was Paul Begala, I think. I mean, Tucker wasn't great later. either. He looked like a clown and he wore stupid bow ties and shit. <laughs> and Jack Stewart made fun of his bow tie. Yeah. And he was like, the- I do wear a bow tie. <laughs> and then, and so, then the next his next gig no bow tie yeah. it, it, it feels so crazy to me that he is like the leading conservative media guy now because like in my formative years i saw this happen and to me he's always the clown with the bow tie and i'm like yeah. how, how 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 is he being paid attention to now but well i guess this article can tells us how it does in fact yeah he learns from john stewart yep yeah, yeah, John Stewart went on there, told them this wasn't a real debate, which is true, and it was fake, and he exposed that, and he says, you're uh, not helping the people, you're helping the politicians and the corporations, and you're part of their strategies, and it was, I mean, like, it was just obviously true, and three months after he came on the show, Crossfire was canceled. Um, so, yeah, that was that was a major thing. Uh, the, this I pulled this out uh, during a monologue of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, which we were just talking about. He said that, like, he he made a joke that our show is at a disadvantage compared to many other news shows. Uh, For one thing, we are fake. Uh, And, like, that, as the article points out and as we're driving towards, is, like, the subtext of The Daily Show was basically that all TV news was fake news uh, and everyone else was lying about it. So just being honestly fake wasn't a liability. It's a huge asset. It was nice to at least have someone be honest about how fake they are. But the thing is, as the article brings up, The Daily Show actually really was news. And uh, I believe you're going to agree with me on this, uh, Wes. But like, yeah, it was my most trusted news source at the time, maybe about on par with NPR. Like, it covered the basic facts of stories. And according to um, 
what, what the surveys where they test people's information knowledge, uh, the viewers were as well informed as those of any other broadcast TV, and they were actually uh, more was, informed. Were they? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was so. It was. Um, what they found was that <clears throat> people who watched any late night TV comedy shows were better informed than people that watched actual news shows. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, but the Daily Show was definitely on there. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was kind of the thing he did where he exposed the news where for for all being manufactured and his manufacturing was at least honest about the fact that it's manufacturing and it was entertaining his audience and one of the things that the article pointed out was that it was really kind of parasitic Mm -hmm. in that the whole daily show the whole the whole show relied on there being all this news being generated by other sources Mm -hmm. that that they had no real correspondence or investigative journalists or anything. They yeah. just took what other people did and, and made fun of it. Right. Under, I guess, so I don't know if you could do this always. The article pointed out that uh, under the fair use copyright exception for parody, the show could steal whatever content it needed from its competitors. So could they have not done this if it wasn't a parody show? I, I kind of so. feel like, I mean, there's damn. fair use exceptions for political commentary. Yeah. So if we is. like if our show wanted to play a clip of an NPR broadcast and then be like, those guys are assholes, we we could totally do that. Oh man, I should totally play a clip from the John Stewart Crossfire thing. Well, feel free to insert it right here. The interesting thing that I have <laughs> is so, okay. you have a responsibility to the public discourse. And you, you fail need to get a job at a miserably. School, I think. You need to go to one. The the thing that I want to say is when you have people on for just knee jerk reactionary talk. Wait, I thought you were going to be funny. Come on, be funny. No, no, I'm not going to be your monkey. Um, <laughs> what? What? All right, yeah, we so just heard John I, Stewart say he's not going to be your monkey. This part of the article was really interesting to me because I was on the Daily Show train for the other end of it. Uh, mm. I, I witnessed the Daily Show die. Um, oh. I... I uh, I started watching The Daily Show something like a year and a half before Jon Stewart left. Uh, Oh, oh, yeah, that wasn't very good. And so, yeah, I I saw the um, uh, the, I saw Jon Stewart do the monologue where he announced he was leaving and then he played the uh, clip of Trump coming down the elevator and screaming about Mexicans and thanking Trump for making his last year his best year, and then his <laughs> slow descent into madness as Trump actually succeeded. Right. So yeah, th- this I I assumed that was just like a uh, uh, a general trend of like media getting worse during the Trump years because they were so addicted to Trump. But this is actually an interesting spin on it because that was. Like in the in the late Obama years, that was really when traditional news media, aside from like a last few shows on Fox News, really started to die. And yeah, it makes sense that that would also be when The Daily Show died. And I think um, if what you might want to take away from this is that the news was actually never better. The news was never good. Yeah, Um, it was in the in the olden days with the fairness doctrine in place, it was more informative, but it was also super boring and nobody watched it except like high minded people who were like, I need to be informed of the issues of the day. And it was like, (laughs) it was like eating your vegetables. How you would like, okay, I've got to watch the news. Not only did my parents watch the news every single day and read the newspaper in the morning, it was a family event for us to all get together and watch like 20, 20 or 60 minutes together. Like uh, when I was a kid. Horrible. It was actually very interesting. Like I found out a lot of cool stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> I watched the news as a kid and I was like, I hate this. <laughs> yeah. So what I don't know. We're weird. What I would be really interested in is someone doing like a deep history of news uh like i i don't just mean tv news i mean like going back to say uh revolutionary war era pamphleteers uh Mm -hmm. victorian era like early newspapers um and like 
I don't know how well this is documented, but like back in the Renaissance or the medieval times or the Romans or whatever, like did people just like literally not know anything about what was happening outside their village or did, was there like traveling merchants who told people about what they were hearing from other traveling merchants or what? So, well, uh, so was, back then they so sent uh, they sent ravens out. <laughs> with, uh, I, I, I'm not talking man. about Game of Thrones. Um, well, why one not? Of the, one of the really <laughs> interesting, <laughs> one of the great things about a merchant coming into town was that yeah, you got to run up and pepper him with questions about what was going on outside of your village. And if you lived like in a slightly larger area, you could have a town crier that once a year would yell out the news. Mm-hmm. I think. A lot of news just got passed along by traveling traveling minstrels and bards, you know, singing about what's happening in the in the in the country in the uh, broader empire. And uh, if yeah, they it was didn't, super accurate too, right? If they weren't, if they were found singing things that the emperor didn't like, they got their tongues cut out. So the, the news, man, news has a very interesting history. But it's so crazy to think about what it would be like in the world where I think it would be a better world when all that you worried about was stuff that could actually impact your life around you. Every now and then, I guess you get surprised by a war coming through your village and conscripting your young men or killing your young men, depending on who's coming through. But for the most part, I guess you wouldn't have to worry about stupid shit and could focus on like who's sleeping with who and uh, why it sucks that your crops didn't come in. Yeah. Inyash, we don't have to worry about stupid shit now. <laughs> we choose to <laughs> because it's fun. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And, and the the other um, like deep question that uh this piece raised for me was like what if we didn't do the fairness doctrine because like the story they told here is entirely one of path dependency where we had this fairness doctrine that mandated we have tv news and then when we got rid of the fairness doctrine people had already sunk all these costs and they didn't want to give up their dependent or uh their um established infrastructure infrastructure. so like if we had if we'd had some other sort of weirdo in congress in the 1960s or whatever like we could just like the news just wouldn't be a thing would the news not be a thing or would they have figured out the like commercially viable news sooner i think we already kind of had that with yellow journalism right where people just published whatever uh whatever other people wanted to read regardless of how fake it was I mean, specifically TV news, Um, because like uh, like I just said, obviously the news as a concept predates television. Um, So, yeah, I I guess as part of that deep history, uh, I'd also want to see like what was radio news like and other things that also required a bunch of infrastructure and sunk cost. But um weren't directly impacted by the fairness doctrine well the fairness doctrine was in 49 which i believe was before tv was super big but when radio was super big so maybe it was intended more as a radio thing than a tv thing and just swept up both yeah i don't know seems likely although no i think it was the fairness doctrine was specifically for television because it was a condition of getting a broadcast license yeah, you need a broadcast license for radio too though yeah but i think it, i think it was only for television and I think that was just because the television broadcast spectrum was so limited. Uh, I don't actually I... know. I'm just guessing. So what the article claims is that Jon Stewart had a dream mm. that he wasn't just going to be making fun of the other newsmakers. Yes. That he was going to just do a news show that was good because it was the only one really trying to be good. Yeah. That the other news shows weren't even trying to be good. Because the, the mixture of like stakeholders in their shows just didn't push them in that direction. Yeah. The article says John Stewart dreamed of a broad, hardworking, underserved middle of the country, hungry for the veracity that he would produce. Uh, and I honestly believe that. Like, that is what you could see whenever he let down the Joker mask a little bit. Uh, I think he spoke about it when he wasn't joking around. You could see it on the Crossfire interview, that that is what he wanted, and he was just trying to use comedy as a way to get to it. Because, you know, the Joker can say things to the king that no one else can. Uh, But as the article, like, points out, he didn't realize that the catch is that mass media and garbage are, one, together. They're 
the mass media is dependent upon it being garbage because they are trying to target literally everyone. And so it has to be that kind of bland stuff. And, uh, and when he tried to make this more authentic thing, he didn't get everybody. He didn't have a mass uh, audience. It says, uh, where was this? Pew Research found that The Daily Show had the most liberal audience of any show on TV, uh, except for Rachel Maddow's, and no show's, viewer, no show's viewers skewed more high income or high education than his. Yeah, and his whole dream was to appeal to a mass audience. Um, but here's a quote from the article. It says, they provided a template for how to be successful not with a mass audience, but with a loyal fragment by replacing the culture of math, mass media with meta-commentary on it and the costly production of original news reporting with an efficient repurposing of others' work. Mm-hmm. Um, so instead of a mass audience, he just got like a devoted niche audience. Yeah. And that is and- exactly what Robert Ailes did with Fox News. Yes, Roger Ailes, I think. But yeah. What I say, Robert? Yeah, it was Roger. Roger Ailes. Yep. Roger and it points Ailes, like- out that um, in the early 2000s that advertising was only about a quarter of the revenue of Fox News and that they got the majority of their money from cable fees. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way – so <laughs> you kids listening, the way television <laughs> used to work was you got the broadcast channels for free and then – you have to pay for cable or satellite. And the way cable channels got their money is the actual cable providers would pay them for the to be able to broadcast them. So if you wanted ESPN, you'd go to the cable channel and um, look for a package that included ESPN from Comcast or whoever. And then Comcast would pay ESPN to be like, okay, we want to include that channel in our package. Mm-hmm. And Fox News was able to, charge these super high cable fees from the broadcasters because there was so much demand for their channel yes they had a very loyal audience that demanded it from all the uh, cable companies and this was not a mass audience like first of all most people didn't get cable and most people who did get cable didn't watch fox news this was like a, a fraction of a fraction but it was big enough that it made up three quarters of their revenue yeah roger ailes was was taking basically John Stewart's playbook, what John Stewart discovered about building niche audiences and bringing it to the news media. The article touches on what exactly it was that John Stewart discovered by doing this. And I wanted to hit those real quick. Uh, he found, first of all, that a real audience that is uh, loyal uh, and sustains you assemble uh, the same places where all audiences nowadays assemble online. And that uh, converting a loyal audience into a media business success is getting to them to be personally loyal to you and identify with your brand. It says that The Daily Show was the first TV show whose clips regularly went viral via emails, discussion forums, and shared BitTorrent links uh, because uh, YouTube didn't even exist yet. The Crossfire appearance was probably the first piece of political journalism that went viral online and was six months before YouTube debuted. So people were still just sending clips to each other in email. Uh, the the audience also is, uh, since a lot of them didn't watch the show directly on TV, they watched like through clips and word of mouth, the actual audience was significantly larger than what the ratings revealed. And they were more personally loyal to Stewart and later Colbert as well. Uh, they shared clips, they talked online, they bought books. And the article contrasts all this with someone like David Letterman, who uh, was, I guess, initially a rival to The Daily Show, which sounds just weird to say nowadays. But yeah, there was a time when Letterman was much bigger. Anyways, he also had a cult following, and you could buy his merchandise and books, but the point of all that was to get you to watch the show. And with The Daily Show, you didn't necessarily have to bother with watching the show. It was a show where like the audience came first, and it was a TV show second, uh, which was the innovation that is now all media right yeah yeah that's really true like i i bought america the book i went to their big rally oh nice um i was like in the thick of it and it really was like we are it was it was it was like our identity it's like we Mm -hmm. are daily show watches like we are john stewart people yeah i thought this was really interesting because uh like i've mentioned on the mind killer I've been uh, reading The Last Psychiatrist and um, his book, Sadly Porn, and something that he talks about there is the selling of 
anti-identitarian, anti-identitarianism and anti-establishment sentiment as an establishment identity. And this, this really, um, this story of Jon Stewart is really congruous with that because it's very much the same sort of idea. Like Jon Stewart's shtick wasn't, um, like it was kind of like, uh, Life of Brian, but in a tragically unironic way. Like he was yelling, uh, we're all individuals. We should all think for ourselves. And the <laughs> audience was echoing that back. Only mm-hmm. unlike Life of Brian, it didn't have its tongue firmly planted in its cheek, or possibly Stuart wanted it to be, but he seems to have failed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this brings us to the thing which really opened my eyes and made me say, I got to do a podcast on this article. I will um, that. The audience, what audience sponsored journalism actually means. Uh, so I, I'm going to touch on what the article says a few times uh, that, uh, or says about this. It says that at first, audience sponsored journalism doesn't sound worrying, but here's some things. Well, it transforms the incentives reporters face. Advertisers like positive stories that put you in the mood to buy stuff, while readers and viewers respond more to fear or anger inducing stories. Uh, advertisers don't really care what the news says, but readers like news that confirms what they already believe. Subscribers are more likely to keep paying if they feel emotionally engaged with the individual journalists they sponsor. And, uh, and well, then they get to the, the second major thing. But before we jump to that, do you guys have comments on this? Yeah, I saw there was a quote in the article from Paul Graham. It says, according to a new study by David Rosado, there's been a big increase in news headlines suggesting fear, anger, disgust, and sadness since 2000, and especially since about 2010. Mm. Uh, Journalists are pushing your buttons, uh, which I anecdotally seems right to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've never heard it explained in this way before, but that makes sense. That if it's switching over from a mass media to a subscription model, that um, activating people's like anger and fear and disgust uh, is much more likely to get them to click the link than you know your your human interest stories that you love so much. I do love them. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're very important to keep things in perspective. Yeah. Um, so what this all leads to is the the final thesis. Uh, at the end of the article, that uh, today people generally don't pay to get the news. Uh, On the internet, facts uh, about what is going on in the world are available in copious amounts and for free. You don't need to pay for them. Like serious journalists still report valuable stories and discover important facts, but that's heavily funded by grants. And uh, the reporting doesn't get much mass media attention Anyway, that, that just bear on the ground what are the facts reporting does. Uh, but what does sell is worldviews, interpretations, and the facts that support them. Uh, journalists are selling compelling narratives that mold the chaotic torrent of events, internet chatter, and information into readily understandable plot lines, characters, and scenes. And and that's that's basically it. We we uh, God I I. I I'm going to say we just for the purposes of this podcast because we do kind of have a <laughs> show and a podcast. Uh, we are creating narratives to help people make sense of a epistemically hostile world. And that is our primary function rather than actually reporting things that are happening because things that are happening are disconnected events that don't necessarily mean anything or make any sense until they're placed in some sort of greater framework. And that's what people actually want. They want the world to make some sense. Yeah, the quote I pulled out was, um, while The Daily Show was helping to kill spin in the aughts, online political journalism was also forging a new coin of the realm, a consistent voice, a clear brand, authenticity, telling your audience where you were coming from, and a certain ironic detachment from any particular take. Mm -hmm. Um, Which, yes, that, that seems like what everyone's going for these days. Yeah. It, I, a little bit after that, I believe it says, uh, in the digital age, you don't really need anyone to read the news to you. What you need is to understand how you should feel about it and what story it tells. Uh, for most readers, the details simply make no difference in their day-to-day lives. Presented with a massive overload of isolated facts, they will simply want to make sense of them. 
Helping them do that is the most valuable and most revenue generating function of journalism today. And that all brings me to like, since the three of us do have that new show, The Mind Killer, which some of you are listening to right now, because I'm assuming this is going up on both feeds. Are we the monsters here? So I don't think so. And the reason why is I'm going to get more into this in my troop deployment. <gasps> but... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably want to get your information from somewhere. I mean, you could just, you know, return to um, the medieval life we were talking about before where you just don't pay attention and don't care. Um, ah, return with a V. Yes. Uh, I'm like three quarters of the way there and i feel like it's a pretty good life um but if you don't if only you then, on this show <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, yeah seriously like most of my news consumption is actually literally for the purposes of filling out our outline um uh that was actually my biggest reservation about joining the show <laughs> it's like oh no Way back when we started in 2020 mm -hmm. yeah um Good Lord, was it in 2020? It was in 2020. Sure it was. This, this was a COVID wow. cast. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Since you aren't going to be getting away from this no matter what you do, your options are either to give up completely, which I would kind of endorse, or to at least find a show where the brand and identity that they're trying to establish is one of actually being factually correct. And uh, that's why, as much as it irks me, I don't actually have that big of an objection to the so-and-so was wrong segment uh, or to um, something else that I forgot about. I've, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I've been drinking while we've been recording this. <laughs> <laughs> um, my current drink is a shot of smoked rum in some... Uh, sparkling lemonade and pink grapefruit soda uh hey. it's very good uh, <laughs> uh so yeah if you find um if you find news sources where their established brand and voice and identity that they're selling is actually about being factually correct i think you can do pretty good uh here and for some further recommendations on where you can get this, see my troop deployment in probably like 15 to 20 minutes. Aren't probably less than that. Probably less than that, yeah. But aren't all news shows um, saying that they are the factually object and correct and I all mean, that? I mean, they say that. Yeah, they say that. But they're mm -hmm. lying. Yeah, so they say <laughs> it, it's not just that they're lying. It's that being correct isn't part of the identity that they're selling. So, like, Tucker Carlson claims that he's telling the truth. But if you go and fact check something that Tucker Carlson says around the Thanksgiving dinner table, then, like, that's not going to be an attack on the Tucker Carlson fan identity in the same way that it would be an attack on like the mind killer identity, except that we are also trying to establish an identity of, uh, you know, being humble and open to correction. Hence the, uh, so-and-so was wrong segment. Yeah. So the article ends with the actual thesis, um, about how Tucker Carlson has completely, like followed in John Stewart's footsteps here. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we and, hadn't gotten to that yet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't. So like I don't. I don't watch Fox News, um, but I catch a little of it every now and then. And it really, I never thought of it as doing the same thing John Stewart did. But when I think about it, a lot of it is this meta commentary on how other news sources are all wrong and biased. Um, and pointing out their hypocrisy and conveying, you know, their audience as smarter and better informed and just like overall better people than the audience for these other things. Um, and that is totally what the whole John Stewart brand, like that was his whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I actually feel like I have a bit of a unique perspective on this as especially on this podcast, because in the mid 2010s, uh, when all of this was ongoing, I lived with my grandmother 
who watched a lot of Fox News, as grandmothers are wont to do. Uh, And it was still in the... um, It was still back in the pre-Trump era when the Prince of the Realm was Bill O'Reilly, who very much was of this, like, old guard school that Jon Stewart was lambasting. And I don't remember that... uh, Admittedly, I tended to leave the room, but I don't remember as much of the, like, uh, grousing about the mainstream media and so on. Like, there was some of it, but not much. Uh, whereas now when I visit my other grandmother and she's watching Fox News again, as grandmothers are wont to do, like, that's all it is. Like, there's nothing else. Now, David, did you watch Colbert? I did, actually. Now, how how accurate was he as like a satire of Bill O'Reilly? Because that was his whole that was his whole thing. He was specifically like, I'm going to do Bill O'Reilly. So he was more accurate in the like in imitating the mannerisms than he was in like the actual content. Uh, Because as far as the content goes, he was pretty much pure Jon Stewart. Uh, He just like uh, dressed up as Bill O'Reilly, basically. Um, So if you imagine a parody cosplay where Jon Stewart is the cosplayer and Bill O'Reilly is the cosplayed, then that's um, then that's mid 2010s Colbert. Gotcha. I got I got a worry still though because, like, as is pointed out in this article and as we have acknowledged, a lot of the news outlets out there is. The audience being told every day, look, this is proof of how crazy those other people are becoming. And uh, they just want to, he- they're just hearing what they want to hear. And uh, you guys are the, we are the sane ones here. And I don't know, how is that? We kind of do that too. Maybe not to the same extent, but like a lot of our things are things like, oh my God, what the fuck is the CDC doing here? Why is the FDA not allowing life-saving treatments to go through? Are they all nuts? Like, why are they doing gain-of-function research? Oh my God, this crazy woke overreach thing is doing whatever. And I, we try to stay out of the culture war somewhat. We touch on them sometimes, but like, don't we do this too? Well, don't we? Why about, is it okay? When we do? Think about the two examples you just brought up there. Hmm. None of those are commenting about how crazy other news sources are. Or how crazy other audiences are. Those are directly things that the government is doing or allowing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's mostly what we call nuts is like actual things that are actually happening. It's not this meta commentary on like, look at these hypocritical reporters. Oh, uh, okay. It's is like, no, the of, government's cause... doing this. Look at what the government is doing. Pay attention. This is actually important. Like, I, I don't watch other news shows. I don't watch Hannity or, mm. or Tucker or whatever. Do they do that? Yes. Yeah, they do. Oh. <laughs> but it's like, okay. it's usually just made up stuff that's not actually, doesn't actually matter. I will say I do still listen to NPR sometimes, even though I had to drastically cut back how much I listened to them, specifically because they were doing this sort of crazy bullshit, too. I and, listen to the New York Times Daily podcast. Oh, my God. How how dare you? <laughs> You're sleeping with the enemy. That's true. <laughs> I'll do it again too. Yeah, but sometimes like it, their their news their news cycle is just the you know the other side is awful. Here's why we're great. Yeah, and I I don't I think we stay away from that. I don't think we're calling the other tribes awful. Uh, it's that true. Much. But are we? So is it okay that we are providing a compelling narrative that makes sense of all the crazy shit out there? Is that what we're doing? <laughs> I think that I don't the feel like we have a, what, a, a, a narrative that makes sense. I, I feel like that's what all news reports shows do now, and we are one of them. Well, I do feel we not like do that? nothing we report on makes sense. Hmm. I couldn't tell you why we're doing gain-of-function research. <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know what the narrative is there other than we should stop doing that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I guess the narrative is like our government is incompetent and can't do anything right. Well, but there we go. Th- is that, that a is... narrative? I feel like that's just true. I, the fact that you feel that it's just true means we're just very good at selling that narrative, right? 
So I think I think ultimately this piece is making two different cases. One case is this general story about how media and news media in particular is more about selling identity than about informing the public in the 21st century. And we are doing that to some extent. The other point I think it's making is about how in, how to put it, they aren't just selling identity, they're selling a specific identity which is in reference to other sources of news media and other ways of getting information. And I don't think we're doing that because we don't spend... 80% of our show sucking each other's dick about how everyone else is covering the stories wrong. And I'm, I feel like the selling identities thing isn't great, but it's also not the worst, especially if you're grading on a curve, because literally everyone else is doing it too. And anyone who isn't has been selected out by the unforgiving Darwinian selection of the internet. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like the, of the bits of Jon Stewart that are really causing problems, it is the self-referential nature of it that's the most problematic, and I don't think we're doing that. I think it's good to, at the very least, keep our eyes on it, because I, I'm not about to stop doing the show, but on the other hand, the fact, the fact that we feel like we're doing the right thing isn't evidence that we're doing the right thing. And like anyone would feel that way. Well, uh, I'm sure Tucker Carlson feels that I way. I think it is evidence. It's just not strong evidence. Honestly, okay. I don't think Tucker Carlson feels that way. Like, I think no? he knows he's bullshitting people. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I, like I said, I haven't watched his show ever. I just assumed that he honestly believed in, in what he's saying and that he's making the world better. Oh, I think he thinks he's making the world better, but I think he knows he's bullshitting also. Yeah. So it's just a noble lie. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else before we go to troop deployments? I no, not really. I, I feel Yinash wants to do more soul searching. <laughs> I that's that's what I do a lot on on podcasts. <laughs> I, I just feel like you know you. I, one of the last things it says in the article is how long can you tell your audience that they're the only ones living in reality before this idea just becomes an alternate reality of its own. I think that's, it's a good thing to worry about. All right. So, well, I, so let's I just, do, let's just do, so I do agree that it's a good thing to worry about. And, uh, just for the benefits of the audience so that like, you know what my, uh, highly intoxicated thought process is. Um, so yesterday, Elon Musk bought Twitter and um <laughs> or, or i think he bought it two days ago but yesterday uh there were these two performance artists who were out in the street uh telling journalists that they were data engineers who had just been fired one of them was uh named raul ligma and or he said that his name was raul ligma and the other was um something or other Johnson. And I was looking forward to talking about this because Elon Musk picked up on the joke immediately and tweeted about how Ligma Johnson had it coming. (laughs) And apparently no one else in media did because there were a bunch of uh, talking heads taking this super seriously. And like, I was looking forward to covering it, but after having this conversation and reading this piece, I don't think I want to, because that is just the media talking heads talking about media talking heads thing that this piece is criticizing. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to do the squishy centrist moderate thing and say, like, I, be- I agree with both. Inyash and Wes, I think at the end of the day, what we on the Mind Killer podcast are doing is different enough from 
what this piece is talking about that I don't feel guilty about it, but I do also think it's marginally making changes in how I think about how I want to cover stuff on our show. Yeah, and I think um, we definitely do cover dumb shit sometimes, <laughs> um, but at least I try to do that really self-awareedly. Like, when I look at our outlines, I know what's junk food and what's vegetables on there. Uh, and try to at least limit the junk food to like, you know, 20% or less of the show. Um, I, you know, I, I enjoy covering it sometimes. I think it's fun. I think it's, uh, you know, it helps our, our audience take a, 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 a comic relief for a minute or two. Um, but, <clears throat> and I think that's fine as long as we're not spending a lot of time on it and we're actually like reporting the other stuff that I think actually matters and aren't, aren't just like, <laughs> You know, we're not blocked and reported. Right. <laughs> Which right. I love, but is definitely junk food. Oh, so much. I, I have to moderate how much I listen to that show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess what 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 should John Stewart do? Should he commit seppuku because he did this terrible thing which he didn't even mean to do? No, but he should probably like stop doing his current show because I hear it's terrible. Yeah, poor guy. Yeah, I hear he it's just like high... woke lectures at the camera. That's not yeah. surprising. Ultimately, I think there's nothing John Stewart can do because everything he's he all the damage he could have done has already been done. I think just in general, this is a really good uh, cautionary tale about tearing down um, uh, Chesterton's fences. Because, like, Jon Stewart blew up the old news media and he had vague ideas about what he hoped the future news media would look like. But it turned out that the incentive structure that was actually in place had different ideas. So, yeah, but you can't know that about the incentive structure in the entire news economy. I mean, like, he, you also, can't know for sure, but I feel like you could at least, like, pay attention and make a reasonably good guess. Well, I also can't say that the news environment would be better without Jon Stewart. Yeah. Like, especially during the the early aughts, I think he was providing a really valuable service. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he was the only one doing anything resembling speaking truth to power. Like, I think this is a classic tale, a tragic tale, that he did a good thing as much as he could, and it ended up having downstream bad consequences and no matter how he would have done it that would have happened because that's just how the world is structured like he you cannot win in this situation and it's also likely they would have figured it out without him yes he was just the first on the scene and at least he was someone with high ideals and a pure heart so that we don't have to hate him for for what happened we can all see that we could not have done better this was just the state of the world but man man it's got to suck to be to be the person who realizes that all of this is because of you and the good things you were trying to do. Don't worry. He'll never realize. Yeah, that may be true. All right. Well, uh, usually at the end of the Bayesian conspiracy, we talk about a couple of the sequences uh, that Eliezer wrote way back in the mid aughts. Uh, in the John Stewart late, times. In the John Stewart times, in fact, uh, laying down the foundations of what we nowadays call uh, Bayesian rationalism. However, we do not have our normal uh, hosts here. We have the Mind Killer hosts. And so instead, we are going to do the thing that we usually do at the end of the Mind Killer instead, so people can get a feel for that. And Wes, since you always corral us over there, uh, would you like to do the intro to this segment? As we all know, politics is the mind killer and arguments are soldiers. So in that spirit, we ask each of our three hosts to send a soldier out onto the battlefield every episode. And we'll start with David. Yeah, so I have been talking to some of my news consuming relatives recently, and they have been surprised at how well informed I am. Uh, especially, and this is me quoting them, because I don't read or listen to the news or watch the news. Um, so I just wanted to share some of my strategies for uh, surviving in the current hostile epistemic environment we live in. And that's to basically give up on general purpose news shows, uh, with, of course, the mind killer being the exception that proves the rule. 
in favor <laughs> of highly specialized um, experts. And I use that word cautiously because, you know, experts don't have a great reputation post COVID, but I, I just take it in the most general sense possible of just like people who know what they're talking about and never mind whether they have the right degrees or the right credentials or whatever. And uh, following whatever they're doing. So I would recommend the Doomberg Substack as an example of this, as it is V. Moskowitz's blog. Uh, Marginal Revolution can be a little bit niche in what it talks about, but the content is almost always excellent. And um, yeah, just in general, when you find yourself encountering a topic recurringly um, and uh, needing to or feeling like you need to know more about that topic, you're almost always going to be better served by finding a high quality blog or Substack or even a Twitter feed by an expert. Or if you have the patience for it, even better, an academic uh, book length treatment of that topic than you are by just picking up whatever you can from mainstream general purpose news. All right. Thank you, David. Eniash, what's your troop deployment this week? My troop deployments sometimes uh, are about fanciful, utopic visions of how the future could be. And this is going to be one of those troop deployments. All right. Yeah, in my future, we all live in much closer, tight-knit communities where people care about each other and live with each other and know each other. Uh, almost sort of a, a return to <laughs> feudalism thing like uh, David was talking about, except without the stupid feudalism. Anyways, um, it is my sincere belief that keeping a constant tab on the news will derange just about any human. Very much like being a law officer will derange you because you're always running into just the worst examples of humanity. And this is not how the real world really is, how most people are. But if it's all you ever see, your mind updates on those uh, on those constant examples. So uh, I believe that in the future, people would generally be best off if simply nobody consumed the news, except for perhaps one, uh, one or two tribal mystics, uh, wise men, shamans, whatever you have that are already a little bit crazy and mentally fortified against these deranging efforts. And they can absorb the news from the outside world and parcel it out and share it with the rest of the community in its least damaging forms and the things that people actually would need to know about. And even maybe take shifts, like maybe two years reading the news and then two years off so that it you have some time to heal your brain between uh, this assault from the craziness of the outside world. And that might be a great way to do things because honestly, most people don't need to get most of the news most of the time. It's just a thing that crushes your soul. So I set this up so that Inyash would make that specific troop deployment so that I could make the surprise announcement that from now on, I'll be replaced by David Yusuf, at least for the next two years on the Mind Killer podcast. Wait, seriously? No. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> All right. Well, my troop deployment for this episode is that we, uh, like Eniash pointed out before, we are trying not to be the monsters. Um, we, uh, I've done this before in a troop deployment, um, but pointed out that we only come out every two weeks, which means we have a slow news cycle, which means we only comment on what we think is important. And as we discussed before, even when it's been a slow two weeks, we try really hard not to just stick in filler stuff and we'll just have a, a shorter episode than usual. And it's fine. Um, all right, we have hosts with actual genuine disagreements about things we actually care about. Like none of the arguments you see on here are scripted. Um, we actually just have different opinions about stuff and we present those opinions um, in a way that we genuinely feel. Not in a way that, you know, we think will make good uh, copy or please an advertiser or anything like that. Um, we correct our mistakes or we try to when people certainly when people point them out, we go back, you know, we do those, uh, you know, someone was wrong segments all the time, specifically because it's important to us to be accurate. And I, you know, one of the questions before was, how can you tell if someone's program is actually cares about the truth and i think that's a big way it's like wh what do they do when they get something wrong uh to the issue of correction on page a34 
um, do they issue a correction at all? Um, and we try to do those corrections really prominently at the top of the show um, because we don't want anyone to believe wrong things. That is true. Um, and uh, finally, we never flatter our audience. Um, our audience is just genuinely the smartest, roast, most rational, best looking and most morally upstanding audience out there. <laughs> um, and we're just pointing that out uh, to be accurate. Accuracy is very important. Very important. So thank you, our intelligent, beautiful, and uh, ethical audience uh, for listening to us this week. Um, this is a, a bonus episode, so we'll be back next week with a regular episode. Um, and thank you, Bayesian Conspiracy audience. Uh, I think there's a lot of overlap there already. But if you don't listen to The Mind Killer, um, it's good. You should listen to it. Uh, mindkiller.substack.com. Yes. I recommend that uh, Bayesian conspiracy audience. Most of the mind killer isn't actually like this because this is more of a Bayesian conspiracy where we just sit and noodle on one topic. We discuss lots of different things that happened in the last two weeks, but it is the three of us and I do think it's a good show. So hop on over there if you would like to hear some more of that. All right. Bye. 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 <laughs>